Welcome back to CS330. I'm Kyle, a CA for the course. Today we have a guest speaker, Joshua Sol Dickstein, uh, who's visiting us from Google Brain. Joshua is currently a senior staff research scientist at Google. Over his career, Joshua has done some really interesting work, both within the context of machine learning and outside of it. Prior to receiving his PhD from Berkeley, he worked at JPL on Mars rovers. Afterwards, he spent time at Khan Academy using computational methods to improve educational outcomes for students. And finally, uh, Josh has also spent some time here at Stanford as a postdoc. Josh's current machine uh, research interests span machine learning, physics, and neuroscience. In particular, he's done some really interesting work on the theory and practice of training large neural networks. So welcome back to Stanford, Joshua, and I look forward to your talk. Thank you. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, great. So I'm super happy to be here. Um, I'm going to be telling you about uh, learned optimizers, um, why I think they are the future, um, why we're not there yet, why they're, why they're quite hard, um, and, and what they can do now. Um, I'm going to be talking about work done by, by a lot of people, um, and especially I should call out um, Luke Metz and, and Nero. Um, Luke Metz especially um, is responsible for majority of the work I'm going to be talking about and is probably the, the, the world expert on, on learned optimizers. Um, I'd also strongly encourage um, you locally and also uh, virtually to interrupt me with questions. Um, I, I really appreciate getting any kind of feedback from the audience at all, so, so be encouraged to do that. Uh, talk structure is going to be roughly like this. I'm going to tell you why I think learned optimizers are going to change the world. I'm going to tell you um, about what learned optimizers are, and then the majority of the time I'm going to talk through um, many of the open problems that are still challenges in, in designing and building these things. Um, and and where, where applicable, I'll give you a few of the solutions that, that we know about. Um, then I'm going to tell you a bit about what learned, where learned optimizers are now, um, what they can already achieve, and I will describe how this approach to optimization can unlock completely novel new capabilities. And I'll end by um, giving a quick demo of a open source li well, a library we are in the process of open sourcing for, for doing research on, on learned optimizers. So OK, motivation. You can maybe tell the story of the deep learning revolution in that researchers used to um, make entire careers out of like hand designing features for image classification. And people also used to um, learn features for, for classification. And for a long time, the learned features weren't quite as good as the hand design features. And then eventually the learned features were better. And now no one has a career, um, or almost no one has a career hand designing um, classification features anymore. Um, and kind of the maybe key attributes that enabled that transformation um, were that um, the amount of compute available to learn, learn these features or learn these functions increased, uh, that the amount of data we had to, to train learn functions increased, and also the fact that the things these learned features were competing against were just hand-designed heuristics. Um, and so in general, if you're performing something with a hand-designed heuristic, you can learn a function that dramatically outperforms the, the hand design heuristic. However, we still hand design our optimizers, and we hand design our loss functions, and we hand design our architectures, and we hand design our regularizers, and we hand design many other aspects of our learning pipeline. Um, and I guess considering this is a meta-learning class, you're probably already convinced of what I'm, what I'm trying to, to convey here. Um, but um, I believe that we are set up for a similar revolution um, in, in the context of, of meta-learning. Um, even, even when well-motivated, many of these things, or all of these things, are, are just heuristics. Um, and maybe for one specific example, which uh, comes up in optimization. If you're writing a paper about some like snazzy new model you developed, um, you're probably going to want to report like accuracy on a test data set in the paper. Um, and when you train your model, you're probably going to train your model 
using cross entropy on the training data set. So even for instance, if you have the most theoretically well-justified optimizer in existence, it's still just a hand design heuristic um, because you're training it on the wrong data, you're using it to train a model on the wrong data set with, with the, wrong, the wrong loss function. Um, and so kind of the, the, the dream is, is that um, these learned optimizers or more generally these learned meta-learning approaches are kind of creeping up on the hand design approaches and, and they're gonna pass them at some point soon and, and then they will be all that people use. Cool. Okay, so I've told you why I think learned optimizers are gonna change the world. So now let me tell you what a learned optimizer is. So um, in standard training, you have some model and that model maybe has some parameters W, which we're going to initialize to W naught. And maybe you do steepest gradient descent. So you update the parameters by um, taking the current W minus some learning rate alpha times the gradient of a loss function L um, with respect to W. And you do this over and over and over again for like capital N training steps. And then at the end of training, you, you measure performance. You like maybe look at the validation loss of, of your model, for instance. Um, what we are gonna do is we are going to replace this um, hand design optimizer, which in this diagram is just steepest gradient descent, um, with a black box. So we are gonna replace this with a function u, where that function u ingests the current parameter values and the most recent gradients and whatever ever other information you wanna pass it. So you could pass it validation loss, you could pass it information about the, the like architecture that you're trying to optimize, um, you could pass it second order information if you have it available. Um, and this function u is gonna have its own outer parameters theta and it's gonna spit out a new value of w. And so rather than applying gradient descent capital N times, we're gonna apply this black box function u capital N times. And then we are going to train this function u. So we are gonna have an outer training loop where you update the parameters theta, the outer parameters theta of, of u. So in this outer loop, the like meta training or outer training loop, we're gonna update theta such that um, if you apply u to the inner problem, you do better at whatever your measure of performance is on the inner problem, be it like training loss of the inner training or validation loss or, or whatever you care about. And then in this inner loop, for a fixed value of the outer parameters theta, you are going to optimize your target optimization task. Um, you're gonna train a neural network with parameters W or um, you're going to fit whatever model you wanna fit that has, that has parameters W. Cool. All right, so this is the high level structure. Um, there is a lot of flexibility in terms of what you choose for, for you, but maybe one architecture which is nice to keep in mind and is maybe the most common architecture that people use um, in learned optimizers is imagine you have a little per scalar per parameter update function. So imagine you have a function which takes in scalar gradients and then outputs um, changes in, in scalar changes in, in parameter weights. Um, this function is often an RNN. Um, you can think of SGD with momentum or Atom or, or most other optimizers as being um, very specific cases of this function in that they act per parameter in the target problem that you're optimizing and they have some latent space, which in the case of like SD with momentum is, is just the momentum variable. Um, and they, they spit out delta Ws. Um, so if you, if you 
um, want to think of a simple case for a learned optimizer architecture, just think of, a, of a, an RNN where like one copy of that RNN is acting on every parameter in, in the target network. Cool. So, yes? Can you separate one thing over into the sequence of separators but don't actually look at the waves? Ah, so um, in general, you can take into account the weights um, and it can take into account other, other information. Um, um, the, the simplest version, just like the, the, the kind of the completely vanilla version is like a per parameter function that only gets ingredients. Um, but, but you are completely right that you can build more complex architectures that, that take into account weight values and take into account a lot of other information. Um, it seems to be a good idea to initialize this function to have relatively small scale output. Um, we haven't really tried to initialize it to be to be the identity, but but um, it depending on how you did that, it probably wouldn't hurt. So just to make clear, this operates on the of scalars, basically. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't have any understanding of the actual terms of structure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's completely true. Um, this is that is not a general property of learned optimizers. That is just a property of of like this particular simple form of a learned optimizer. But it's it's easiest maybe to reason about one that act, that acts on scalars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, quick question. Um, does the learned optimizer, like, in and of itself, is optimized by an engineer, like, optimizer, right? Yeah, so, so we're going to get to that. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about that more in the talk. The answer is that um, basically yes. We have done some fun experiments where you can um, train learned optimize, which I'm actually not going to talk about. So, But we have done some fun experiments where you can um, kind of bootstrap learned optimizers by using randomly initialized learned optimizers. So you can like randomly initialize learned optimizers and one of those learned optimizers, if you like, you know, like maybe like 30 or 40% of the learned optimizers will make some progress on gradient descent after random initialization. And so you can like constantly just use the current best learned optimizer to keep on training them. And it's like a little bit of an elaborate infrastructure kind of thing. Um, but it will eventually do a good job at training itself. It'll just take, take longer. But, but yeah, you're exactly right. Cool. OK, so I told you that I think these things are going to change the world, um, or at least like a small, a small region of the world that I live in. Um, I've told you um, what they are. And now we're going to spend the bulk of the talk talking about um, why they're hard, um, maybe ordered roughly um, in in um, level of like increasing challenge. Um, so um, maybe problem number one is how do you get a learned optimizer to to generalize to new optimization tasks? Um, in in standard supervised learning, for instance, you typically have to like train your model on like thousands to to millions or even billions of examples before it generalizes well to to new examples. So so if we, how do we hope to do the same thing in the context of learned optimizers? Um, and the answer to this is um, a lot of work. So I don't want to in any way dismiss the answer to this because it's really a lot of work, but it's also fairly straightforward. Um, the answer to this is you need to construct a large um, data set of, of optimization tasks that you can use to, to train your, your learned optimizer. Um, and and here, here we have a, a particular data set of like a, a thousand some odd tasks. Um, and there's a similar data set that's going to be part of the open source release that, that I, I hinted at the beginning of the talk. Um, and um, in fact, we find that this works the way you would hope. Um, so here we are showing uh, performance on an IID um, test set um, as a function of the number of optimization tasks that you train the learned optimizer on. And, and you see a curve that, that shouldn't be surprising, which is that the 
more diverse optimization tasks you, you train on, the better you generalize to additional optimization tasks. Um, there is a um, problem with this, which is largely unsolved, so I'll describe this as like an open challenge, which is um, that generalizing across scale remains really, really hard. Um, you'd really, really like to train these things on an ensemble of small scale tasks and then have them generalize to, to like train GPT-3. Um, but the problem is that training learned optimizers is very expensive. And so you can't just incorporate GPT-3 training as like one of your training tasks. So you somehow have to like train an ensemble of smaller scale tasks and then be able to generalize to very, very large scale tasks. Um, and, and this is, is not yet something that, that works well. Um, yeah. Yes, I have a question about sort of this task distribution problem. I'm saying sort of generating across scale, but it seems it's also generating across distribution. So, and what I'm thinking is that, when I'm not expert in this, yeah. sort of general thinking, you, you know, you have this, you have these tasks which are sort of distributions over data, albeit image data, or maybe the language data, whatever it is. And each of those distributions have their own sort of similar statistics, their own optimization, landscapes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what you sort of like if picture you show, you know, there's basically like a it's a set test set. Yeah. So it, it is perceivable to me that you know, have this like multiple tasks which you create that they're kind of like the distributions within each task are not necessarily different. And as you're optimizing this, the parameter is this thing kind of as well, or the test mm -hmm. optimizing the test distribution because the loss landscapes, the summer statistics, whatever, are perhaps not similar. Uh, but is that the case if you actually try to take this like learn how to write a password to somewhere else where basically the last landscape can be can have much more healthy structure and one thing is kind of more than with the personal learning work. The optimization problem with the personal learning is quite different than the optimization problem for supervised learning and later games. For example, you want to be able to transfer something like that. Yeah, so that is a great question. Um, how you even define outer domain generalization is like um, both in optimization and, and even, even in like, I don't know, images or text. It's just like, it's really like how far, how do you measure distance if you're moving out of domain? Like, like how, how different is, is the distribution? Um, we do find, um, and I unfortunately don't have, have plots about that in this talk, but we do find that if you hold out one class of problems, so like for instance, you um, don't include any VAEs in, in the, the meta training set, and then you use the optimizer to train uh, VAEs, um, we do find that increasing the meta training set size um, improves performance on, on the holdout class of models. But it's hard to know like which class of models should I really consider um, as being like outside of the training distribution. Um, it looks like pretty, so it seems to me that a lot of this sort of has to do with the landscape of the data distribution itself. So have you had experiments where maybe you try like to like the same sort of like image net of the space and image net and then without any NLP training and then maybe you try to talk about the people? Um yes, we have. Um, um we haven't we haven't specifically done image net to, to NLP. Um I would have to um we, I, I would have to I would have to, to look back at which specific sets of experiments we have. Um, I think we, we the, maybe the most dramatic we did is we we tried transferring to RNNs um, without training in any RNNs, um, without outer training in any RNNs, um, and and there the learned optimizer works. Um, it transfers. Um, it doesn't transfer as well as you would like. So it, it's it's like kind of in this like gray you know sort of yeah kind of region. Um, cool. Um, partially because we want to address questions just like that, um, we would like to understand how these things work. Because the more we understand how they work, the more we can identify how to make them work better, and maybe the more we can, we can develop lessons that we can 
um, even transfer from, from learned optimizers to, to more traditional optimizers. Um, so um, one way to try to understand how these things work is to take a very simple form of a learned optimizer and train it to optimize very simple tasks and, and do our best to like introspect and, and decompose how it does it. So in this particular case, we um, took a per-parameter um, GRU, so a form of RNN learned optimizer, and we trained it um, on one of, so each of these gets a different learned optimizer, one of either linear regression on a 2D data set or, or Rosenbrock, uh, Rosenbrock loss function um, or a small MLP um, trying to solve the, the two moons um, classification problem. Um, observation number one, which is nice, is that if we train these things, then they do in fact do better on each of these tasks than the um, tuned, well, learning rate tuned baselines. Um, but that's not maybe the part that's most interesting. The part that's, that's most interesting um, is trying to understand how, how they do as well as they do. Um, and just to give a, a flavor, maybe, and of the type of analysis that, that you can do, um, we are running a um, RNN on these tasks. Um, and you can analyze RNNs using, using tools from, from dynamical systems. So one of those tools is if you hold the input to the RNN constant, then there will be um, fixed points, um, which in this case are also attractors in the latent space of, of the RNN. And if we look at the um, attractors in the latent space of the RNN, as we um, change the input magnitude, so we pass it in like a fixed input, which is just like this, in this case, the input is gradient. So we pass it in a fixed input, which is just the same gradient at every time step. And we look at where the attractors in the state space are. Um, first of all, we find that there's one primary attractor um, per input. So it has like a very, very simple attractor um, structure. And second of all, those attractors are arranged in a line depending on the gradient magnitude. And we can then look at one of those attractors and we can look at the um, output that the learned optimizer will produce as a function of gradient input at that attractor point. So um, in this case, for gradients um, that range between like negative 10 and 10 on the, on the Rosenbrock problem, um, we see that for each of these fixed points, we get a roughly linear relationship between the gradient and the parameter update. Um, and that roughly linear relationship corresponds to gradient descent, where the slope of this line would correspond to the learning rate in, in standard gradient descent. And so we can then look at um, how this learning rate changes as a function of these fixed points. And what we find is that for the fixed points corresponding to larger magnitude gradients, um, either very large positive gradients in green or very large negative gradients in, in red, that the effective learning rate shrinks. So maybe one kind of neat observation is that this thing is learning a um, behavior, which has been like fairly recently um, adapted as like standard practice in, in hand design optimizers, which, which is um, learning rate adaptation. You can similarly look at, uh, yeah. How do you wait? Which plots do you mean? So, so the prediction is very compared to the artist's problem and momentum. Um, the yeah. 
So how, how does like each of these plots generate? Because there can be like different options and learning aids for different languages. Yeah, so um, what we did in each of these is we tune the hyperparameters of these um, algorithms for each of these um, three, three tasks. Um, uh, so so um, it's, not, it's not one set of, of, of hyperparameters. Um, we did not, the main purpose of this is not to, I mean, this, these are like stupid toy tasks. The main purpose of this is not to, not to like, like um, compare the, the, the performance of, of learned optimizers and, and hand design optimizers here. Um, cool, you can also identify other behaviors that these things learn. Um, one, one particularly neat one, um, which, which again is something we've already discovered um, in, in standard optimizer um, land, but, but is really neat to see that these things are able to like discover themselves um, just based on, on the data is, is kind of a behavior of, of gradient clipping. So in the previous plot, we were um, zoomed in right around here um, be, with gradients varying from like negative 10 to 10 on the Rosenbrock. And so if you zoom out and you look at the relationship between gradient and update, then you find in all three problems, the learned optimizer is learning to do something analogous to um, gradient clipping, where it saturates at, at very large gradients. Um, and maybe more interesting, you can build a histogram of the gradients that these optimizers experience while training these problems from like random initialization. And you find that the linear region is well matched to the um, most common um, gradient distributions. And the saturation is mostly cutting off the tails of the distribution of, of gradients. So it's like learning gradient clipping adapted to, to the specific task that, that it, is, it is learning. Um, cool. So there are some tools that we can start to use to understand how these things work, um, but there's still these like black box neural networks. Um, one of the primary reasons you might want to understand how they work is that you need to figure out what the right architectural structure for, for learned optimizers is. Um, in, in vision, um, things like convolutions um, and residual connections, um, or at least like patch-based um, like processing are completely crucial to, to the success we, we achieve. So like, open problem is like, what are the corresponding architectural motifs in the space of, of optimizers? And I can talk through um, some of the maybe themes that we've, we've roughly identified so far, but, but we don't really know the answer to this. This is, this is very much um, an, an open question. Um, but, but just to give a, a flavor, some of the, the themes that seem to be crucial to, to their um, success um, is first of all, if you want them to generalize, you wanna make the input features that these things are fed um, invariant to either like gradient or, or parameter scale, um, whichever the input features correspond to. Um, and so for instance, one way you can do this is by rescaling the gradients by um, something like an RMS prop style um, est running estimate of the standard deviation of, of the gradient. Um, you similarly wanna make the outputs of these things um, invariant or I, I, guess, I guess equivariant to, to parameter scale. So, so one way to achieve this is to make the output like a fractional change in parameter rather than an absolute change in parameter. Um, so scale the output by, by the parameter norm. Um, you want to provide as much information about the problem as you can. Um, this is maybe not surprising, but the more um, features you provide the neural network, the better it is able to, to perform. Um, that is maybe reassuring and that it means we're training them well. Um, on the other hand, there is a cost to, to um, giving these things more features and greater architectural complexity, which is that there's an overhead associated with them. Um, and so for that, you want to choose an architecture that somehow minimizes 
the, the per-parameter compute required by the learned optimizer. One way to do that is by, by um, making the learned optimizer hierarchical, where you have like a very small number of parameters, a um, very small number of learned optimizer parameters and learned optimizer state per, per inner parameter. And then you have like a large amount of learned optimizer state like per problem or, or per array in the target problem. Um, we can, mm -hmm. yeah. I was interested in the normalization, like could that apply to the validation loss and other parameters like that to just seems across different types of training tasks, you're going to get completely different yeah. values. That is a superb question. Um, and yeah, you want to normalize everything. Um, and that includes, um, if you're passing in like training loss or validation loss, that includes normalizing that. Um, one way you can do it is you can um, do like a percentile style normalization um, based upon the history of validation losses or history of training losses that you've seen so far during optimization. So you can be like, you know, your, your um, current um, validation loss is at level like 0 0.1 compared to like all the validation losses you've seen during training. Um, but you do, you need to figure out ways to normalize basically everything. Um, other, otherwise, it, it um, really doesn't like it if you change the scale of something. Um, cool, and so, so you, can, you, can, you can quantify these trade-offs, of course. Um, it's maybe nice to see here in the, there's this like aqua point in the lower right. Uh, so these plots are like performance on the metal loss versus um, overhead in either computational time or in terms of uh, memory of the, of the learned optimizer. And you can see this aqua point in the lower right um, corresponds to like the learned optimizer with absolutely everything in it. And um, that does the best, which is nice, um, and is also ridiculously expensive. So um, you probably want to keep in mind somehow the like trade-off between overhead and, and architecture when, when choosing how to build these things. Um, cool. Okay. Now we get to the one which I think is actually the coolest of the challenges and, and also maybe the, the, the most challenging of, of the challenges, um, which is that outer training a learned optimizer is um, basically um, like a dynamical system with a dynamical system in, in every step of the, of the training process. And so all the pathologies that a dynamical system can have, like chaos or divergence um, um, or extreme sensitivity to noise, um, can now happen in like every step of the dynamical system. And these things can be horrifyingly unstable to, to train. Um, and there's a, some fun examples that you can do to, to visualize this. Um, so here, we are training a three-layer MLP on MNIST, and we're just using Atom. There's no, no learned optimizer here yet. And we are um, training this many, many times from the same initialization with the same random seed, the same ordering of mini-batches, all of that. Um, but we are slightly changing the learning rate that Atom is using. Um, so specifically, we are varying learning rates between like 0 0.1469 and 0 0.1484. So we're changing the learning rate in the third significant digit. And then we're just going to run Atom training. And what you're looking at here is a projection of the MLP parameters. So this is like a trajectory taken in, in the MLP parameter space. And initially, over the first few training steps, you can see that for all the Atom learning rates, the training trajectories are very, very similar to each other. But as you train this for even a relatively small number of training steps, like just a few tens of training steps, you find that changes in the third or fourth significant digit of the learning rate lead to like diverging trajectories in, in parameter space. Um, so if you were going to backpropagate through this, if you were going to be like 
D final solution of the optimizer, D learning rate, you are going to have like severe problems here because changing the learning rate by like one e negative four can like jump you from like here to here in, in parameter space. Yeah. Say that again? Same weights. Same weights, same mini batches. Uh, this was like run with like a VMAP. So like really everything's the same except, except the, uh, um, the learning rate. Um, and if you want some reassurance that we did the experiment right, you will notice that similar learning rates are like very, very close to each other. Um, so this would not be the case if the diverging trajectories were due to like a problem with the random seed. Mm -hmm. There are three regions ish in that. Like, is each region similar ultimate performance? Um, yeah. So you're asking what the what the. So let me let me rephrase your question. Um, it's a really good question. So let me rephrase your question. Um, we're showing that the final parameters, inner parameters you get, um, are can change dramatically based upon small changes in in your training parameters. And you might ask, okay, but maybe these are all equivalent. Like maybe like changing your um, maybe the like outer loss, like maybe the training loss is like the same for all, all of these places or, or within all of these places. Um, and the answer is, and, and I'll show some images in a moment, um, coarsely yes, but on a fine scale no. So, so um, like all of these will have like approximately the same training loss, but that won't help you for optimization because the training loss is going to be like jumping up and down in like a very jagged fashion based upon like very small changes in the learning rate. Um, and we can visualize that and we get, we get some like really pretty images. So, so let's, let's look at some pretty, more pretty images. Um, so um, here we're looking um, for kind of the same qualitative problem, but now we're looking at it for a learned optimizer. And now we're going to look at the loss rather than the final parameter values of the problem that we're optimizing. So here, what we have is a um, learned optimizer. This is like an MLP learned optimizer, it doesn't really matter. Um, and we're doing a two-dimensional slice through the parameters, the hyperparameters of the learned optimizer. So basically you're trying to move in this space to find the best performing learned optimizer. Um, and um, I think in this case, we're training like a two layer convnet on, on MNIST. Um, and so um, the question is, what does this lost landscape that you're trying to optimize when you train the learned optimizer look like? And if you unroll the inner problem for one step, so if you only apply the learned optimizer for one step, then it looks really nice. You like start up here and you're gonna do gradient descent and you're gonna like go down there and it's super smooth. You could use like analytic gradients. But as we apply the learned optimizer for more and more and more training steps, then you see that you get more and more structure, um, like complex structure in the meta loss landscape. And this happens relatively fast. This is only like unrolling 10 training steps. Um, and so if you apply the learned optimizer for like 20 training steps or 30 or 50, then you now have this incredibly complex um, loss landscape. Um, and essentially every pixel in this image is a different loss value. So this is gonna be like a horrible loss landscape if you wanted to descend it by like steepest gradient descent because like, um, first of all, the gradients are gonna be like magnitude 10 to the 30. And second of all, like there's no way you're gonna navigate like this structure to get to this like broad low loss region. Um, yeah. So this is a result of using like over no, this is, so this particular image is for a learned optimizer, but you can get this kind of behavior even for a hand-designed optimizer. Um, and it's actually even worse than that. The best performing, so okay, so let's say you're just tuning learning rate on like an optimizer. The best performing learning rate is often like epsilon away from the learning rate that diverges. So typically, 
um, outer training, so like training of your metaparameters or your learned optimizer parameters, um, converges to, to the region that is the edge of instability or, in, or in unstable. So, so it's not just that there are these like horrible regions in, in parameter space, it's that the right answer like lives in these horrible regions in, in, parameters, in outer parameter space. Um, yes. Um, um, actually, I took out of the talk um, actually a toy problem where you can where you can show show kind of um, um, how this can happen. Um, one one situation is you could have like a toy problem where you can like fall into one of two solutions, and um, exactly which solution you fall into like depends in a very sensitive way. On, on the parameters of your optimizer. Um, there, it can happen in a whole bunch of, do I have intuition for why the edge of, edge of instability is the best way to train, or do I have intuition for, for like why, why it can go chaotic, maybe? Yes, why is that, so I guess, why is this whole problem so fundamentally unstable in terms of loss landscape? Yeah, so um, um, I, so I think I, so, okay. So I think I think the reason this is like such a fundamental problem, um, and the reason it's resistant to like attempts to reparameterize the optimizer to be more stable, is is because um, edge of edge of chaos or edge of divergence um, are the best parameters that that you can find, um, and I think maybe you can think about why that is maybe with like a toy a toy case like if you are trying to do gradient descent in, uh, there's no markers, trying to do like gradient descent in like an ill-conditioned Gaussian, then um, you want to descend as fast as you can in the shallow direction. And so you wanna set the learning rate as high as you can to descend in a shallow direction. But if you set the learning rate too high, then you're gonna diverge in the high curvature direction. And so what you'll do is you'll set the learning rate as large as you can without diverging in the high curvature direction. And this means that you're gonna be bouncing back and forth like as much as possible um, in the high curvature direction in order to descend as fast as possible in the, in the solid direction. So even in this like 2D like ill-conditioned quadratic, your optimal like hyperparameters are at the edge of divergence. Um, and I think this is a more general um, property. Um, these are also made worse if you use techniques um, like Atom or RMS prop or anything that like normalizes anything where the learning rate sets the update step length rather than setting a multiple on the gradient. Um, and that's because as the gradient shrinks, your update step length doesn't shrink. And, and you probably want to do this because kind of the, the characteristic step length you want to take for most problems is like really specified by, by the scale of the parameters, not like the scale of the gradient necessarily. But doing this means that you're never going to converge to a fixed point. You're always going to bounce back and forth around, around some kind of minimum. And, and those like, trajectories are going to be, are going to be chaotic. Um, OK, so pretty picture. Um, like really complicated structure really fast. So, so how do you possibly deal with this? Um, so the best solution we found is to smooth the outer loss landscape. And by the way, this is maybe an open theory question if you have any thoughts, which is why is this like lost landscape like chaotic on a, on a fine scale, but not chaotic on like a coarse scale? Like why is it that like moving epsilon like changes your, your loss almost as continuously, but like moving by a large value changes your loss relatively smoothly? But, but given this like empirical structure, um, one solution that would seem to work pretty well, given this picture, is maybe we could just like smooth this. Maybe we can evolve this with a Gaussian and, and then we'll have like a nice smooth loss landscape that we can descend. Um, and, and so we can, we can in fact do that. So um, one way to do this is to train these things using variational optimization. Um, so in this case, we're gonna define a a perturbation distribution over the parameters. And then we're gonna define a new loss, um, which I'm gonna call fancy L here, um, as the average of your loss L 
over this, this perturbed distribution over, over the parameters. Um, and so here we're perturbing the parameters with the Gaussian, and this is equivalent to convolving your lost landscape um, with, with a Gaussian. And okay, that sounds maybe nice, but how do you actually um, compute this thing? And there are maybe two, two approaches that you can take to, to um, compute this, this smooth loss landscape. Um, neither of them are, are, are perfect, but both of them, both of them work. Um, one of them is, is called evolution strategies. Um, so in evolution strategies, you, you basically use like the, the, the reinforced style trick to, so what we're interested in, right, is the gradient of, of fancy L with respect to the parameters. And so one way we can get that is we can use a reinforced style trick to tear, turn the gradient of the expectation under a distribution into the expectation of the weighted gradient of the, the log distribution. Um, and so we can rewrite this gradient of this as like an average over samples drawn from the perturbation distribution of the loss function times the gradient with respect to theta of the samples. And then just subbing in the form for, for that gradient, um, this is just the um, loss um, scaled by the, or, or the perturbation and parameters scaled by the loss. Um, and rewriting this one more time, um, you can see that this is effectively, um, here we draw a perturbation from a Gaussian, and we're essentially taking the correlation of the um, perturbed loss function and the perturbation itself and using this as, as an estimate of the, the gradient. Um, and I'm gonna do one more step to this, which, which I think is useful in, in two ways. Um, so specifically, we're gonna replace this average with an average over um, positive and negative perturbations. So before we just had L of theta plus epsilon s times epsilon s, and now we're gonna have L of theta plus epsilon s minus L of theta minus epsilon s times epsilon s. And so this is just averaging over the contribution from the positive epsilon s and the negative epsilon s um, contribution. Um, and this is nice for two reasons. One of the reasons this is nice is I think it makes it really kind of visually obvious that this is a finite difference algorithm. Um, we are going to like randomly perturb our loss and we're going to evaluate our loss at those two at the randomly perturbed location and the negative of it. And that's going to give us an estimate of the gradient. Um, it's nice in another reason, which is that um, antithetic samples like this um, turn out to be completely crucial to this being in any way practical. Um, in that um, this um, cancels out any variance due to the constant value of the loss function. Um, so you end up with a much lower variance estimate. Um, this also induces a really nice property, which is not captured by variance alone, which is every single sample now will give you a descent direction. So no matter how high variance that direction is, it's never gonna point uphill. And the reason for that is that the sign of the gradient estimate is always determined by the actual sign of the change in, in the loss. So if you like increase the variance of this thing, it will turn more and more and more and more towards like 90 degrees, but it's never gonna make you go in the wrong direction. Um, and I think this has not actually been like characterized well theoretically, but I think this is partially explains why, why the performance of this particular like finite difference algorithm is like sometimes better than you would predict just from its, from its variance. Um, okay, so I mentioned there are two ways that you could do this. There's a, another way you can compute the gradient, which is that you can use the, the reparameterization trick. Um, so you can, um, once again, um, pull out the perturbation as like a separate variable, and then you can just average over perturbations of the gradient of theta of the loss of theta plus that variable. These two estimators of the gradient of the metal loss have um, very different variance properties. If your metal loss is smooth, then the reparameterization gradient, it has like analytic gradients inside it, and it gives you a super low variance, super accurate 
um, estimate of the gradient. While if the um, loss surface is, is smooth, um, the evolutionary, evolution strategies estimate of the gradient is like kind of crappy. It's pretty high variance. On the other hand, if your loss surface has like a lot of like high frequency structure, as the metal loss landscapes often do, then the um, evolution strategies gradient estimate is still kind of crappy. It's still pretty high variance, but it's not any crappier. It's like, you know, roughly the same variance. Whereas the like reparameterization gradient is now like you know twenty or thirty orders of magnitude larger than than it was before. Um, this also, by the way, um, this plot also, by the way, illustrates kind of a property I was talking about before. Um, so this is an estimate of the gradient of the, each of these um, of the variance of each of these estimators um, over the course of a meta optimization problem, and you can see that we initialized the um, learned optimizer in a region where the analytic gradients were pretty good. And over the course of um, meta training, the learned optimizer converged to a region that was like on the edge of instability, where, where the RP gradients become like completely useless. Um, cool. So we have a couple different ways that we can estimate this thing. Um, you can combine these two estimates of, of the variance. Uh, so, so um, for instance, one way to combine them is just to um, weight the two of them by, by their current variance. Um, and we'll get to some plots in a while, but in fact, in fact, this, this does fairly well at, at meta training. Um, cool, this is maybe a good time to pause for a second for any questions. Cool. Okay. Um, next challenge in making these things work well is that outer training is extremely expensive. Um, completely naively, if you think it takes like capital N steps to train a model where N is like 10,000 or a million or something, now, when you're training the learned optimizer, you have capital N steps of inner training for each of the capital N steps of, of outer training. So your meta training cost is like a factor of like 10,000 or a million or, or something very large, um, bigger than, than your standard training cost. This um, is not a problem that's fully solved. But there are a few, a few passive, a few, a few solutions. Um, one of the solutions is to work at Google and and run this thing in ten thousand machines. But that's that's maybe not the solution that's that's most most useful for all of you. Um, another solution is is um, you can do like really clever um, vectorization and parallelization, um, low level kind of things. Um, and actually, if you use Jax, uh, Jax is like a beautiful at this. So for instance, you're applying the same learned optimizer to like every parameter in every task that you're optimizing. And so you can do things like vectorize over the um, inner tasks that you're, that you're optimizing um, and can make really good use of accelerators that way. Um, another thing that you can do, which almost everyone does, is, is you can use um, partial enrolls of your, of, your, of your inner optimization. And we'll talk about that in a second. Um, although partial enrolls come with their own problem of, of bias, and um, I'm going to sell one particular approach to to doing partial enrolls while while removing the the problem of bias called called persistent evolution strategies. Okay, so what are partial enrolls? Um, if you've trained RNNs, um, you, you're probably familiar with 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 this approach. Um, this is when you have like an unrolled computation graph that you're training, and rather than training the entire thing at once, you like unroll it for a few steps, and you compute a gradient based upon those few steps, and then you unroll it for another few steps, and you compute a loss in the gradient for that new few steps, and you keep on repeating this, and you never propagate the gradient through the entire sequence. Um, this is great in that you have many more training gradients. Um, 
you get a gradient from every one of these inner trun truncations. Um, it's also great in that we showed some plots of how the metal loss landscape becomes like more and more chaotic the more steps you like unroll optimization. So this gives you like a better behaved loss landscape. Um, however, um, it sucks because it's biased um, and because you're like cutting, cutting these connections in, in the training graph. Um, this bias doesn't actually seem to hurt you that much um, when you're training RNNs, at least at least like LSTMs or, or GRU style RNNs. Um, but it actually turns out to matter a lot when you're um, training learned optimizers. Um, and here's, here's an example um, figure, which may be um, from, a, from a paper by, by Wu and Ren, um, which maybe kind of illustrates why this is, why short horizons and bias can be particularly harmful in, in the case of, of learned optimizers. So here we have a loss function, which is just a 2D quadratic, um, which is um, ill-conditioned. It's much higher curvature along the y-axis than it is along the x-axis. And this quadratic also has um, a little bit of added noise. Um, so it's like stochastic gradient descent style, style quadratic. Um, and if you want to make the best progress you can in optimizing this, then you want to use a large learning rate. So you move quickly along this low curvature direction. Um, however, if you want to descend to the lowest lo losses possible in a small number of steps, then you want to use a small learning rate so that you descend rapidly in, in the high curvature direction. And so if you do partial unrolls, then you will tend to be overly greedy in your optimization. And you will tend, in even a simple loss line scope like this, to prefer a too small learning rate that descends rapidly to the bottom of a valley without navigating along the valley. Um, and we can see that in, in practice. Um, here we are training um, a couple layer, I believe CNN, on, on MNIST, and we are just using an atom optimizer, and all we're tuning is the learning rate. And um, here, this is like outer training. This is our training of the learning rate. And we're changing the number of partial unrolls we're doing in this training. And you can see exactly the same effect. You can see that if you do very short unrolls, then you have a learning rate that you learn that's um, biased low. And as you increase the length of the enrolls, then you become more and more and more aggressive with, with the learning rate. Um, and so short enrolls are great in that they make everything stable and fast, um, but they suck in that they make you choose like very conservative hyperparameters that, that slow your optimization um, to a crawl. Cool, but we have a magic trick that can get you the best of both worlds. Um, and so this magic trick is something called persistent ES. And um, what it looks like is like doing ES for each of the partial enrolls, but then also accumulating a term which, which corrects for, for the truncation bias um, over, over the full, full sequence of enrolls. So, so it's nice in that you can get gradient updates much more quickly um, for each short enroll. Um, it's nice because it's at least eventually unbalanced, uh, unbiased um, in, that, in that this like accumulated um, correction term will, will mean that by the time you reach the end of the sequence, the sum of the gradients um, from each enroll will be correct. Um, and it's an ES method, so um, it smooths the lost landscape, um, which for us is a positive. And it means that there's no actual like analytic gradients required. So there's no like having to store the computation graph in memory. You can just like run it once uh, forwards. So I'm not going to do the derivation, but just to very quickly highlight um, kind of the changes. Um, it looks a lot like standard ES. Um, the difference is we have this one additional accumulator variable, which is going to accumulate um, the sum of all the perturbations we've experienced so far. And then um, every time 
you um, update a particle, you update this accumulator with the um, perturbation that you used for that particular unroll of the particle. And then when you compute the gradient estimate, rather than taking the loss times times epsilon, you instead take the loss times the like accumulated um, perturbation. Um, cool, and this thing works. Um, here we show a comparison of ES and PES um, training a, a simple learned optimizer. Um, and it's nice in that, in that PES runs converge more reliably um, and converge eventually to a lower loss because they're unbiased estimators of the gradient. Okay, so cool, that was, that was all the problems. And now we're gonna look at some pretty plots where learned optimizer curves go down. Um, this is a really good time to like, like ask any questions you have about, about why these things are hard um, or, or not yet solved. All right, pretty plots. Um, so what can learned optimizers do, do, do now? Um, one thing they can do is if you are willing to put the compute up front to meta train a learned optimizer on a specific task, um, they can do much better than even the best tuned um, um, hand design optimizer on, on that task. Um, so here to make that more, more specific, um, we are going to be meta training a learned optimizer to um, train a two hidden layer confnet on um, 10 way image classification problems. And um, so we have an inner loop where we are training a confnet. We have an outer loop where we are using a meta loss, which is either the final training loss or the final validation loss from training the confnet. Um, we have a distribution over tasks, which in this particular case is going to be randomly generated. Um, 10, 10 class classification problems um, from ImageNet. Um, and then in the most outer loop, we are going to be finding the learned optimizer parameters theta that, that allow it to do best on, on this task. Um, and in fact, what you find is that reassuringly, the, the um, learned optimizer, so here the red line is the learned optimizer trained on the final training loss of, of, of this um, is able to significantly more rapidly um, achieve a, an essentially zero training loss. Um, you never believe other people's baselines, but I will say this baseline is um, a very strong baseline. This is Adam with um, um, learning rate decay and regularization um, over like 2,000 um, draws of hyperparameters where we're doing both um, exponential and linear learning rate decay, and we're doing both L1 and L2 regularization. Uh, so this is, this is a very well-tuned uh, hand design optimizer. Even cooler, you can target something other than training loss with a learned optimizer. So for instance, you can make your meta loss the validation loss. And um, if you do this, um, maybe it's actually first interesting to observe what happens um, both for the well-tuned atom and for the learned optimizer when they very rapidly minimize the training loss, which is that they also very rapidly diverge and do significantly worse on, on the, the test loss. So this is maybe evidence that doing better at optimization um, is like, often not what you actually care about when you're, when you're doing, doing optimization. Um, but if we um, meta train an optimizer using a validation auto objective, then it's able to, to get to a lower test loss um, than, than the well-tuned well um, baseline. Uh, yeah? It looks like the, the training objective it does really poorly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm training, but yeah. they're not, that validation does really well. But if it's supposed to target generalization, shouldn't it also, given that it comes from the same distribution, shouldn't it also 
Performing yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great observation. So, so I noticed the y-axis is different here. So, so it achieves like a test loss or validation loss of like 1.2, which would be like up here. So, so it does it does do as well on training as it does that actually does better in training. Um, but it's it's really cool that the um, best validation loss is like one of the worst training losses. Like it it really kind of like highlights this this uh, this property. Um, cool. Okay. Then there's a question of how well do these things generalize now? And the, the answer is that um, they generalize better than hand design optimizers if you have a limited hyperparameter tuning budget, and they generalize worse if you have a large hyperparameter tuning budget. So, so for instance, um, here, um, this, X, this is a distribution over many um, optimization tasks. And what the x-axis is um, a normalized score comparison between a learned optimizer and a hand design um, baseline. And more to the right is better. And here what we're comparing against is the single best hyperparameter across all the problems for Atom or um, Atom 8P, which is an Atom with more hyperparameters, um, or, or an Atom W. Um, and you can see that if all you get is like one run on your target problem, then learned optimizers will typically do much better in that one run. So a learned optimizer is better at like adapting itself to a new target problem and, and optimizing it well. Um, as you increase the number of hyperparameter tuning um, trials that you're allowed on the target problem, then eventually um, hand design optimizers um, become able to generalize to new problems better than learned optimizers with, again, just one run. Because there is, for current learned optimizer architectures, no notion of like hyperparameters you can tune at application time. So, so if you're willing to spend like 1,000x compute on your hand design optimizer, then you will um, generalize to new tasks better than the learned optimizer. If you're only willing to run your hand design optimizer once, then the learned optimizer will, will, will work better. Um, and um, so this is cool. This is promising. Um, this is not yet going to, going to replace um, state-of-the-art on large-scale problems, but, but we're, moving, we're moving in the right direction. Um, and one more, which I think is just like a super fun experiment. Um, one of the most out-of-distribution tasks that you can imagine is training a learned optimizer. And so we can take a trained learned optimizer and try to use it to train additional learned optimizer. And um, it works. These things can, can train themselves, given, given gradient estimates that come from ES. Um, and um, you can training curve here um, looks like roughly similar to, to training curve you get if you train a learned optimizer with, with, with Atom. Um, so that was a really fast summary of the current state of the art, which is these things can target specific problems and do really, really well in those specific problems. Um, these things can generalize, um, and they can generalize better than, than untuned hand design optimizers on new tasks, but not as well as like very well-tuned hand design optimizers on new tasks. Um, and they can train themselves, which is, which is just kind of fun. One other thing, which I'm going to go through really fast because I also want to show you a quick collab demo, which I think is very neat, um, is that you can do things with learned optimizers that um, are maybe impossible to do with, with hand design optimizers. Um, and maybe one example of that might be um, unsupervised representation learning. Um, so like in unsupervised representation learning, you have a mass of unlabeled data, and you want to learn um, some representation of that data, um, which is useful for, for downstream tasks. And um, the problem with this is that you somehow need to optimize for like attributes that you don't know at training time. And all our current approaches to doing this 
are, are essentially like hand design surrogates, um, which, which have like um, mixed success. Um, but a really neat thing you can do with meta learning is you can target um, performance on something like this where you don't know the desired properties at training time. We can take an ensemble of tasks where we know something that we wanted to do downstream of that task. So for instance, you could take ImageNet and you could train an ImageNet in an unsupervised fashion and you know that after training, it'd be really nice if your like, optimizer has like, learned something about object identity um, so that you can do classification. And so you can try to meta train an unsupervised learning rule that does well on existed supervised learning tasks. So that if you give it like unlabeled data for a supervised learning task, will produce representations, which you can then um, use for, for um, rapid training on that supervised learning task. Uh, on, yeah, when given a small number of labels on that, on that task. Um, and so the hope is that you can then like learn a parameter update rule that is able to, to do this for, for totally new tasks. Um, ideally, you could just learn a general rule that like could generalize across data modalities, could generalize across neural network architectures, um, just give it an architecture and some, some unlabeled data and it will come up with a representation which is in some way useful. Um, and okay, I'm not gonna talk about the architecture, um, but you can, you can do this and you can meta train um, an unsupervised learning rule that learns representations which are useful for downstream tasks. And um, here we have just a neat example where over the course of meta training, um, we initially have a learning rule that just learns noise and then over the course of meta training, um, it begins to learn things like um, digit templates and MNIST. This is the same learning rule, by the way, applied to different, arch different networks and different data sets, um, or like oriented edges on, on CIFAR. Um, and you can similarly ask how this thing generalizes. Um, it's able to generalize or write. Um, this is not state of the art but it is um, able to, to um, perform in a totally unsupervised way um, learning of, yeah, it's able, it's able to, to learn to do unsupervised learning. Um, you can similarly generalize across architectures, um, either depth or width, and, and you find that, that if you've, if you've um, phrased the rule to be, to be suitably general, that I can also generalize along those axes. All right, that was super fast for that because I wanted to, to have a minute to do a, a fun collab demo. So we've talked a lot about how expensive and impractical these things are. Um, we've also talked about how we have tools now that make them more practical. And we've talked about how um, modern accelerators um, you can take like surprisingly good use, make surprisingly good use of vectorization on, on modern accelerators. Um, here I'm going to show you some experiments. These are going to run on a single core of a TPU here. Um, you could also run this on a single GPU and you would get like very, very close um, near identical performance. Um, so these are, the resources required to these are, are like not super high. Um, this is a library for um, learned optimizers that we are in the process of open sourcing. I was hoping it was gonna be open sourced by today, but it may check again in like a week, um, but very soon. Um, and so just to like walk you through defining and, and training one of these things. Um, first of all, you can like um, specify the architecture for the learned optimizer and you can either um, use an existing off-the-shelf optimizer um, architecture, or you can modify these things to define your own. And then you specify the um, task that you want to train the learned optimizer on, um, or the set of, or the family of tasks. And in this case, we're going to 
um, train a learned optimizer to optimize a very small 32 hidden unit um, MLP on 8x8 fashion MNIST. And you specify um, schedules for, for um, the um, number, you specify how you want, how, how many steps you want to run the inner optimization problem for. So we're just going to try to train on 8x8 fashion MNIST in 100 steps. Um, you can parallelize over, over multiple instantiations of this task. So this is like mini batch size, but the mini, mini batch is like number of tasks simultaneously. Um, here we're defining the task family is just equal to this one task. Um, you can choose your gradient estimator. Um, I talked about PES, and so we're going to use PES as a gradient estimator. Um, you choose the outer optimizer. So the way in which you are going to um, update the outer parameter theta of your learned optimizer. Um, in this case, we're going to use Atom to update our, our um, outer parameters. And uh, we set a random number. Um, and so I'm going to run this cell. And now we are going to train the system. We're going to initialize it. And then we're going to have a pretty standard training loop where we train the thing for um, 2,000 optimization steps. Um, there's a pause at the beginning while um, Jax compiles the, the um, outer training process. And then this should take about a minute and a half. Um, so this is, this is cool because I think this is the first time that um, there's been infrastructure that allows you to do experiments on learned optimizers that are like on a single machine in a collab, as opposed to on like 10,000 machines in a, in a cloud. So, so we very much hope that this will turn out to be um, really useful for, for, for turning this into a more, a more standard um, research topic. Um, I'm going to wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What have you guys been working on? Um, so in terms of open sourcing it, probably the last like two or three months. Um, a lot of this though is built on like internal infrastructure that we've been like developing over the last few years. Um, I should also, by the way, shill for Jax. Um, I know, I know you. Many of you are probably PyTorch um, users. If you, if you really want to do flexible things with gradients, for instance, um, or a parallelization, um, Jax, Jax is your friend. Um, cool, okay, so now we can, we just trained to learn optimizer, that was it. Um, there was like maybe 15 seconds of awkward pause and, and we're there. Um, here we can plot the meta loss over the course of, of training. Um, as you would like, the learned optimizer gets better and better and better on this task. Um, as we do like 2,000 steps of, of outer training. Um, now we can test it. We can compute um, a, the inner training curve of the learned optimizer applied to a random initialization of the task it was trained at. And let's also compute some baselines. So we're going to train the, we're going to use Atom with uh, three different learning rates to, on the same task, to, to train the same task. And so one learning rate, two learning rates, three learning rates. And we can plot a comparison. And um, OK, great. We've now trained a learned optimizer that outperforms a coarse grid search of learning rate only atom on, on this super toy task. Um, so that's reassuring. Um, we can now maybe ask some questions about generalization, which I know is like something that many people ask during the talk. So let's load up a different ta task. And now instead of training a like 32 layer, one hidden, one, la one hidden layer 32 unit MLP, let's train a two hidden layer MLP with 128 units per layer. Uh, and let's train it on 28 by 28 fashion MNIST instead of eight by eight fashion MNIST. And we're gonna use our learned optimizer, which we train on the other task in order to, to train this new one. And we're also going to train Adam, use Adam to train on this, on this new task. Again, we're waiting for Jax to compile and 
Cool. Okay, and now we can plot the performance of all of these optimizers. Um, and you can see that, as predicted, um, generalization of this learned optimizer trained on a single task is not great. Um, it doesn't diverge, but it also doesn't optimize. Um, whereas learning rate tuned atom um, continues to, to, to optimize. Um, but we have just run a learned optimizer experiment um, on one TPU core in about five minutes in a, in a live demo. Um, and you can do the same at home. All right, and um, I think that is, I have the summary slide. Cool, so um, just to actually say the summary, I think learned optimizers are gonna change the world. Um, I talked about what a learned optimizer is. I talked about the relatively large set of open problems, um, like how do you come up with a training distribution for these things? How do you understand what they're doing? How do you engineer them to have inductive biases that are well suited to what you want them to do? Um, how do you deal with like the chaotic um, and super poorly conditioned loss landscapes? Um, how do you deal with a large compute cost? How do you deal with bias from um, unrolls? Um, how do you get these things to scale from small problems to very large problems? Um, we talked about what learned optimizers can achieve now, um, which is that if you have one very specific task and you're willing to put a lot of compute into pre-training, then they will completely win on that task and they can generalize all right. They can generalize well compared to like a small hyperparameter training budget. Um, we talked about how you can meta-train parameter update rules to optimize even in situations where you don't have an explicit loss function um, during training time. Um, and we did a quick demo of, of a coming soon open source package for, for working with them. Um, and that's all I got.